Well, welcome back to part three. So I hope you've enjoyed the first two parts. Um, <clears throat> we're moving on and eventually you'll see this painting, but not quite yet. So this is where we've come from. We've seen Expressionism, Cubism, Futurism, Dada, De Style, and Surrealism. Uh, please remember that Dada and Surrealism are the anti-rationalist movements. And that's a quiz question, so we'll have to get that. So artists continued to react to intolerable behavior by political leaders. Um, this painting by Pablo Picasso um, commemorates the killing of over 1,600 civilians by German bombers at the arrangement of the Spanish leader Francisco Franco. <clears throat> it was a test. So Franco was a generalissimo of Spain and he saw the power of Hitler rising and he wanted to be one of Hitler's buddies and so um, Hitler just wanted to be able to test a bomber over um, a real village and he didn't want to bomb any German villages so he asked Franco if he had a village that didn't matter and Franco said sure take this little village of Guernica so um, German bombers came and uh, completely obliterated the village killing everybody uh, men women children in the village of Guernica so this was an outrage that hit the newspapers of course um, and Picasso was in Paris at the time, and it was front page news. He was furious. He was in deep mourning. So he expressed his feelings about this event um, that was really the responsibility of the leader of the country of Spain, um, that, who was supposed to be there to protect his people, and instead he caused this to happen. So Picasso expressed his horror, and he painted this in black and white. This is um, not originally in color at all, and it, you can see recognizable forms here. It looks like uh, there are animals. There's a bull, um, a horse. There's a mother over on the left side holding a dead baby. So everything here was designed to express the horrors of this event and to um, illuminate it in the public mind. So it's huge. It was 25 feet long, still is. Um, and it's like on the grand scale of the history paintings of France, only it's Picasso's very abstracted work called Guernica. Um, so the restricted palette of black, gray, and white reflected newspaper photographs that publicized the atrocity. The distorted victims evoke a heartfelt comment on an international scandal. So this is um, modern sculpture now. Constantine Brancusi did this torso of a young man. He had worked under Rodin, who did um, the, the Burgers of Calais. He sought purer and more ideal forms here. He emphasized form, the formal and the conceptual. The male human trunk, I hope you see that there, has been turned into three cylinders balanced on two cubes and two trapezoids. So the whole thing is the sculpture. Um, and he's just calling it torso of the young man. Um, so this is, uh, Brancusi is a very influential sculptor. This is not the one I would have chosen. I think there was Brancusi in that degenerate art exhibit too. And here's Henry Moore, an English artist. Henry Moore's recumbent figure was inspired by the chalk moles of Mayan art. Um, it orients natural striations of the wood to the design harmoniously. So I think you can see it's female. It's got some breasts up there. It has a big void. Most of his figures of humans have voids, but they're very rounded forms. Certain elements are defined while others flow together in an undulating mass more resembling a hill than a human. An open cavity emphasizes the relationship of solid and void. So there's the chalk mole. 
Um, I believe he said he was inspired by chalk murals. And you have to remember when we saw the chalk mural in American art that there was a receptacle there. There's a little opening in the stomach for an offering. And so that might be uh, what his inspiration for this hole was, this void in the form. Anyway, there you go, chalk mural. And here's another invention in 20th century art. And this is Alexander Calder. He's an American sculptor. And he experimented with movement. So he does a lot of pieces that are very colorful, very fun, and they have motion. So uh, he experimented with movement of flat shapes in space. Lobster trap and fishtail is a mobile sculpture in which individual parts float in response to shifts in the air. Uh, it was the first mobile and mobile and the first use of time as an element. So every time you looked at this, it would be different because um, all these pieces would swing around on these forms. I really like uh, Calder. I'm sure you can find a video showing this actually moving so you can see it. But if you ever saw a mobile, if you had one when you were a kid, if you made them in school, uh, you can... Uh, go they go back to Alexander Calder he invented them now here's something completely different so um, if you've been hating all that modern art then you're gonna like this because this is regionalism it was an American movement um, and it's a reaction to modernism so Regionalism is a reaction against and a return to simple roots in the rural heartland, reflecting an optimistic survival of the Great Depression. So yeah, we're poor, yeah, but we've got our spirit and, you know, we can get through this. So that's what real regionalism is all about, rejecting that aesthetic, that um, abstraction of European art. Sort of. Uh, so on the left we have um, a Grant Wood and on the right, is a Thomas Hart Benton, who's one of my favorites, uh, showing Daniel Boone on the right. Uh, Daniel Boone with his dog and kid walking across the mountains, North Carolina. Uh, the left, uh, Grant Wood was from Iowa. So here's Grant Wood's American Gothic. And this will show up too on your quiz. You need to know this. Um, so it's very iconic. It's been co-opted by a lot of people who put different faces in there or completely different figures posing in front of this simple little clappered house. Um, but this is the original. In his iconic American Gothic, he shows a pair with a pitchfork standing in front of a carpenter Gothic style house, a sincerely affectionate portrait of small town Iowa. So if you have trouble remembering the title of this, just look at the window on the house, and it is a Gothic arch, a pointed arch, and this is American Gothic. Okay? Got that? I hope so. And here's another Thomas Hart Benton one that I really like. So Thomas Hart Benton uh, uses a lot of undulating forms and shapes and making the landscape um, almost look like it's breathing and it's alive. Just look at the clouds in the air. So this is obviously some uh, wheat harvesters. I love Thomas Hart Benton. Very cool. So there is our list. Look at how it grows. <laughs> oh, so many. But in actuality, during the Great Depression, reality sucked. Um, many photographers were hired to document the problems of farmers and migrant workers in 1935. Dorothea Lang was touched by the struggles of the poor and the unemployed. Her most famous photograph is Migrant Mother in Nipomo, California. So uh, many people left the, the Dust Bowl of the Midwest, of Oklahoma and Kansas, uh, because there was a drought and they could not raise their crops. They had no money. They had no way that they could buy food. They were starving. So they, people just picked up if they were able and got, hit the road to go to California, the promised land, or so they thought, because there was so much agriculture out there that they could work. And then they got there um, by the hundreds, if not thousands, and didn't find work, had great difficulty finding work, and there were camps set up 
um, almost like internment camps where the people could could stay and they, there were um, charities who could give them soup. And Dorothea Lang went out and photographed uh, many people in one of the camps. And apparently her work uh, brought this situation to the awareness of the people living in the towns around there. And then uh, they did bring aid and they, they helped these people tremendously. So she educated people. So her, here's artwork that actually made a difference. Um, another thing that happened during the Great Depression was we get a, a move of African Americans who had been in the rural South, had been uh, working farms, sharecropping, or whatever, and, and decided to go seek a better life in the North. So um, you get a, a great influx of creativity, of artistic people moving into the cities of uh, the North. So New York and Chicago and St. Louis um, in particular. So the great migration of agricultural Southern African Americans to the North prompted what was called the New Negro Movement. Uh, Aaron Douglas, this work shown here, is part of the Harlem Renaissance. He was originally from Kansas, but he moved to New York. And he was influenced by synthetic cubism. He developed an abstract style based on silhouetted figures from African art. The flat planes evoke a sense of mystical space and miraculous happenings. So this is from his series, Aspects of Negro Life. Um, this is the first part. This is from slavery through reconstruction. It was intended to awaken a sense of the African American's place in history. So in this mural... Um, in the foreground, all these little white forms down here are cotton balls, and there are slaves, enslaved people picking the cotton. Um, but you can see there's a lot more going on here. So this is sort of like the beginning, and then uh, we have this man standing up on, on something in the middle, holding something in his hand that is very important because you have these radiating circles. Um, he's holding the Emancipation Proclamation here. Um, and he's pointing to the Capitol building, meaning um, you are free, and you are free to vote. Um, I think this man might actually be holding the Emancipation Proclamation, now that I think of it. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Look at me. It's because I can't do this in, sl in slideshow format. Okay, this man on the right is holding the Emancipation Proclamation. And this man in the center is holding the, the ballot. So he's saying you can vote and vote for um, good government. Over here you've got dance and music. So you have the artistic elements. And over here you've got the threat of the KKK. So you have somebody coming in on horseback. But if you just look at the whole thing and the very simplified shapes and the, uh, the palette chosen with these limited colors and these sort of gradients going from a uh, really high tone yellow uh, to darker yellow to orange. I think it's just gorgeous the way he works. I think I have another Aaron Douglas. Yeah, this is the birth of jazz um, in this one, also part of his series. So you see how that device of having these radiating circles um, carries over here where we have the radiating circles coming out from the saxophone there. It's a pretty cool. Actually, um, and a photograph here from the um, Harlem Renaissance shows the work of a, a photographer, James Vanderzee, and he created positive, non stereotypical images that proclaimed racial pride and social empowerment. So, here we have a couple wearing raccoon coats uh, photographed on a street in Harlem. He depicted the new Negro man and woman here. So, I love the coat, I love the car. Um, so anyway, that's really fun. So you have to think that the Harlem Renaissance was a very positive, uplifting movement of not not only visual art, but of music and of dance and um, jazz. This one I think really should be put in first. Um, 
And this is Jacob Lawrence in Migration Series, uh, Panel 1. During World War II, there was a great migration north by Southern African Americans. And so he did this whole series illustrating um, this movement and uh, in positive and negative aspects of it. So here it shows these uh, gateways to three cities and this mob of people filtering into through the gateways to go north. So this is... Uh, panel one, so this shows the, the departure from the southern communities, and uh, just very simplified shapes. Everybody's in silhouette form, and a very limited color, like there's only one green, but that same green repeats. There's a light blue, a red, so um, narrowing the palette gives it sort of a, a sense of unity. I'm sure you can see that. And here's Romare Bearden. This is um, the man from Charlotte, the African-American artist who uh, became quite uh, prominent in 20th century art. And there's a park in Uptown that's named for him. Uh, we don't have any, any, any really good images of his work, but I have a, this one on the left. And then there he is standing in a gallery with some of his work on the right. So... <clears throat> this is a prominent muralist, uh, so we're going to, to Mexico for a minute. A prominent in the Mexican mural movement was Diego Rivera, who studied synthetic Cubist style. Um, I hope you are aware of how many times I've mentioned Cubism, uh, you know, many decades after the birth of Cubism. So it, it had great influence. So this uh, mural was planned. The Man Controller of the Universe was originally commissioned by the Rockefeller family, one of the um, Robert Barron family, very wealthy. But because it included a depiction of communist Lenin, it was rejected. So he planned this, and then they said, no, we don't want Lenin. Um, but Rivera recreated it in Mexico City. It shows that man is out of control, perhaps a modern interpretation of Pandora's box. So that's, that's the interpretation of it, is that man has pushed too far. Things have gotten bad. You can see here soldiers in gas masks. If you, um, and, of course, I think representations of the atomic bomb. There you go. Now his lovely wife, Frida Kahlo. So um, I also like to tell my students, they find this really hard to believe, that when I was your age and I was taking art history for the first time, uh, she was never mentioned. She was totally marginalized. And that shows how much the, the subject of art history has changed, that women have gained a place in it. There are several women artists that we've seen and uh, now she's more famous than her husband, Diego Rivera. And it was just the opposite when I was in school. So here's uh, Frida and a photograph of her on the left and a painting that she created, a self-portrait on the right called The Two Fridas. Um, so in this painting, she presents a split ethnic identity between the two Fridas, one is dressed in European dress and the other in Mexican clothing. An artery runs between them, beginning at a miniature portrait of Diego Rivera, whom she was in the process of divorcing. She's got it. She's holding it right there in her left hand. Um, the style, oh yeah, the style may look surrealist because she's painting an unreal scene as though it's very real. Um, obviously, you know, if you look at the heart there, that's not real. Uh, but she's giving them all of the illusionism that she, that she would if they were real. But she's not a surrealist. That's why I, I told you all the purposes of surrealism was to sort of jolt the viewer into this higher consciousness. And that's not her purpose at all. She's all about uh, delving into herself, about uh, figuring out who she is and exposing or dealing with all of her own baggage. So she's almost always the subject of her work, as it is here. Let's look at a little architecture as we finish up here. So um, 
New York clients preferred the historicizing approach of the East Coast buildings, such as the Woolworth Building here. Um, and New York took the lead in skyscraper development. Cass Gilbert, unlike Louis Sullivan's new style, returns to historical Gothic style. So, yes, this is Gothic. You can kind of see up here some crocketing and this little uh, spire up there. So, yeah, there's little Gothic elements, but they're like way high up. I think anybody down on the ground level walking um, down the street wouldn't see the Gothic elements there at all. Um, and it, you know, the use of Gothic in this building, this Woolworth building, also suggests the American religion of capitalism and commerce. Like, what's more important here? It's making money. Woolworths, elements of the skyscraper I'm not even going to talk about. And here we get um, to our most important American architect of the 20th century, and this is Frank Lloyd Wright. So the international style became the movement embraced by business leaders, but architects and critics called for an American architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright advocated an organic approach exemplified here in Falling Water in rural Pennsylvania. He cantilevered a series of broad concrete terraces out from the house. Bands of windows and glass doors offer spectacular views and unite the outdoor and indoor spaces. Wright's prairie style of architecture caters to basic human needs of prospect and refuge. There's actually a tree, like the, the house is built around a tree. There's a patio in there with a tree um, coming up through it. It's built over this natural waterfall. Um, and this is shown in the autumn. So this is American architecture, and it's, it's not um, the most influential, but Frank Lloyd Wright was extremely influential in domestic, in houses, like the very idea that you, uh, your home might have a dining area and not necessarily a door that you can close on the dining room, or there's just like this open plan where you flow from space to space, except for the bedrooms. Generally, bedrooms have doors, but um, that whole idea was Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, here's the Poll Everywhere polls for your uh, information. So I hope you get these. Remember this one? Okay, the end is very near.